Chairman Chappell. Yep. Council Cogstall. Here. Council Dahlbeck. Here. Council Jordan. Yep. Council Marvin. Here. Council McLaughlin. Here. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the minutes of the August 9th meeting in front of us. What's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I move that they are approved as printed. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. We always have that there so that anybody that's unhappy or has a certain problem that we haven't put on the agenda for tonight, now's your chance. If it's on the agenda, we don't want to hear from you right now. Seeing none, we'll close that part. Reports and correspondence. <clears throat> Councilor Dalby. Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, like to uh, mention that, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, Council uh, voted to uh, review the employee compensation uh, plans for uh, the employees of the town, and uh, the town manager and I uh, met this morning, we've met previously, but uh, I had an update this morning, and I would just like to report that uh, we've obtained all the available market data uh, that we set out to obtain on which to uh, base our recommendations. Uh, the uh, town manager and his staff is in the middle of analyzing it. Uh, we will be, uh, uh, the town manager is really involving uh, his uh, departmental managers uh, in the process to assure an understanding uh, on their part of uh, whatever results come out of the report and we should uh, have uh, recommendations in the not too distant future but I will leave that to the town manager to uh, specify uh, more accurately on that. Uh, I might uh, mention that um, uh, we uh, voted not to use, we voted as a council not to use consulting help, so this is maybe taking a little bit of time because we are using our own folks uh, to, do, to do this study. Thank you, Councilor Dalton. Anyone else? I'd like to report on the Regional Waste <coughs> Services uh, Finance Committee meeting held last Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. We're having quite a time with the bond issue as you know, when you see the papers or you have bonds of your own that you're buying and selling, the, the rates are about going variable or going fixed are quite a discussion for us when we're talking $8 million. So we have our recommendation for the full board for next this Thursday night. And at that time, I'll be able to report to you next time we get around as to what we're doing. I got a, seeing no other reports, I got a letter here that came to Mike from the <coughs> Chief of Police that I want to read your parts of. And I think it's very important that we get this out to the Cape Elizabeth uh, citizens. You probably saw it on the Access Channel on South Portland's notices tonight. As we have discussed, there appears to have been a considerable amount of confusion regarding New England Telephone Company's bulk mailing of 9-11 service postcards to Cape Elizabeth residents. As this new service only affects South Portland residents, Several Cape residents have erroneously dialed 911 for both emergency and non-emergency services. After relating these incidents to Peter Kovac and Gail Skelton of New England Telephone, NET has agreed to send a mailing to all Cape Elizabeth residents clearly explaining that our emergency telephone numbers have not changed. I'll ask the uh, town clerk, Deborah Lane, to please give us a report on the status of our upcoming election. Thank you very much. We do have an election coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd, included with the state referendum questions will be a special municipal election, including a position for town council and school board. Nominations are, nomination papers are currently available in my office. They are due on or before Tuesday, September 28th at 4.30 p.m. I do encourage anyone that has any questions to please telephone me or come into the office and uh, we will make sure that you do get your papers, and it's between 25 and 100 registered voters that you would need to obtain. Thank you. Yes, 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, want to note that this Friday, Dick Fickett, who's the Public Works Supervisor, the Highway Supervisor, will be retiring after over 25 years of service to the community. Uh, Dick uh, has really been a tremendous asset to the community. Uh, he, um, for those that maybe don't know him, he generally plows the municipal buildings and uh, some of the school grounds in and around this area. Uh, he's done so many things over the years. Uh, to, to assist the different public works directors, and uh, he doesn't want a whole lot of fuss over his retirement, but I, I couldn't let this uh, meeting pass without uh, noting uh, that we will miss Dick and uh, really appreciate all he's done for the community. Mm -hmm. Any other reports or correspondence? And just one other item, if I may, get down here. Manager Michael McGovern and myself as chairman of the council were privileged to go to Dallas, Texas to the International Association Fire Chiefs meeting when our chief received quite an honor. If you come up here at this time, please, I've got just a little something that I would like to read for him and present to him, and it'll be incorporated on the plaque if we ever get time, if you kept us to run around so much in that time. Whereas Philip D. McGurick was recently elected president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, and whereas this organization and its 10,000 members provides important fire safety and fire protection programs to citizens throughout the world, and whereas Chief McGurick has already shown tremendous leadership within the Maine and New England Fire Chiefs Association, and whereas our fire chief is the first chief from Maine to head this prestigious 120-year-old association. And whereas the town council is proud of Chief McGoldrick and knows that the knowledge he will gain and the friends he will meet will enable him to provide exceptional service to the Cape of Fire Department for many years to come. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape of the town council and town council assembled that we hereby congratulate Chief Philip D. McGoldrick on his election as the international leader of all fire chiefs, and we wish him well as he assumes this important position dated the 13th day of September, 1993, at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and signed by all the councils. And I'll let you look at it, and I'm going to take it away from it. <laughs> I'd like to thank the town council and the citizens of Cape Elizabeth for this uh, resolution. It's, it's quite an honor to me. Uh, one of the few times it's left me speechless. I do want to say that without the support of the council and the, and the citizenry as a whole, that there's no way I'd ever be able to um, take, take upon this uh, endeavor. Um, I also very much appreciated the fact that the Michael and Herb were there to support me when I, when I received the uh, um, presidency of the International. So thank you very much, everybody, for all that you've done for me. section over to get us started to the chairman of the committee that did such a wonderful job on this and the presentation that we received about a month ago was very thorough and very well done and we congratulate them on it. Now it's your turn, the public, to ask questions after Paul and his people uh, give them very brief uh, introduction to the program tonight. Paul. It's a pleasure to be here, Mr. Chairman, town council members. I think it's important that you have an opportunity to, to fully understand the scope uh, of the project that we have presented. I'd like to touch on briefly on some of the key issues uh, that we have been faced with. One of the questions is why do we need to renovate our schools? The current middle and elementary schools were constructed in 1930 through 1962. The last major renovation in addition to the middle school was in 1960. 
and to the Ponco School in 1962. Building elements, electrical system, mechanical uh, equipment have all exceeded their useful life. The cost of maintaining these are very expensive uh, and we can expect some crisis situations. Uh, equipment will ultimately break down. Although attempts have been made to, conf to conform with code requirements, the facilities are not in compliance with current code. Handicap accessibility is limited and difficult. Fire alarm systems should be upgraded. Structural components need to be corrected. Mechanical systems not pri provide the ventilation currently required. Temporary buildings, referred to as the portables, provide approximately 13,000 square feet of space. These units need to be replaced with permanent structures. The facilities are inadequate for our current programming. The cafeteria in the Pine Cove schools also functions as a gym with columns in the center. The middle school cafeteria is located in the basement and is substandard. Media centers in both schools are too small. And these are only a few examples of the problems that our teachers encounter. Staff has been extremely creative under the circumstances to maintain the level of education we have come to demand. Our educational program will suffer without adequate facilities. Another key issue is the current traffic pattern between the two schools. This is an extreme safety consideration for our children. Why this project? The combination of factors I briefly mentioned require a comprehensive solution. Our committee undertook the systematic approach to the problems. We enlisted the help of teachers from both schools in order to have a better appreciation and understanding of their needs and operation of the schools. We developed a mission statement and evaluated the program. From this, the architect <coughs> produced plans that reflected the space requirements of the program. The committee spent a great deal of time discussing and evaluating various alternatives for both schools. Consideration was given to minimize the cost impact of this project. By striking a balance between renovation and addition, we have been able to reduce the co construction costs. Unfortunately, this is still a significant project. The concept plan, we feel, not only corrects deficiencies, but provides the programming space necessary for our educational program. Why both schools? They are equally in poor condition. A single plant provides heat to both facilities. Site conditions can't be resolved without addressing both schools. Why can't we ob obtain state funding? The formula for state funding is complex with many applicants. Our submission ranked 36 out of 56, and only four were funded. <clears throat> is the cost reasonable? The architects have prepared budgets that reflect the scope of the project. The estimates are representative of current construction costs and comparisons were made with similar projects recently bid. Preliminary studies were undertaken, for example, the asbestos survey, to mitigate any potential for surprises in our budget. In conclusion, I believe the committee has presented a comprehensive plan to correct existing deficiencies and provide facilities to support the educational program for the next 20 years. This is a concept that serves as a blueprint to undertake the next stage of design. The weeks preceding the referendum is critical for you to learn more about the needs and solutions. The feedback we will receive is extremely important in finalizing the design to ensure that the community's goals are achieved. I hope that you will tour the facilities, talk with the staff, read the various reports and recommendations. The members of our committee will be pleased to discuss the details with you. In our hope that we can provide you with the necessary information for you to make an informed decision on the merits of this project. <coughs> Would like to now turn it over to Ian Chapman. Thank you. Good evening. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, I'm currently chairman of the school board. I'm also a member of the building committee. And before that, I was a member of the school space study committee. Um, three years ago, the Town Council created the School Space Study Committee, which studied our school facilities and brought to light the serious deficiencies in our middle and elementary schools. As a result of that study, the kindergarten was moved to the high school to maximize use of available space in our school buildings, but that certainly didn't solve all our problems. 
A year ago, the Town Council created the Building Committee, which developed the plan to fix our town's school buildings for the next generation, which is under discussion tonight. Connie Goldman and Paula Liberty and others will speak tonight and describe the deplorable physical state of the buildings and the pressing need to pass a referendum on November 2nd. But I would like the citizens to consider the following as they examine and comment on this plan. Each member of the committee has put forth an extraordinary amount of effort and commitment in this process. The committee is composed not only of elected town, uh, town uh, councilors and um, school board members, but several Cape residents who willingly donated hundreds of hours to wade through technical documents and study the physical condition of the buildings, learn about the various state and local regulations affecting the project, and analyze and debate a wide range of possible educational site and building solutions. No one on the committee was interested in building the kind of opulent Taj Mahal we see cropping up in other communities. Throughout the process, and I'm sure the architects will attest to this, co committee members felt a heavy responsibility to their fellow taxpayers to come up with a building plan that is cost effective, practical, and flexible enough to meet the needs of our community and our students for the next generation. I believe the plan before you meets these goals and, and we are certainly glad to have this opportunity to get your input and comments tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I have a few slides that I want to run through quickly. I know that the temptation to get into detail is one that I have a hard time with, but I'm sure you'll all keep me on track. <coughs> so, and I, does this come up? has already made mention of the fact that this is essentially a project that tries to take the existing school buildings that were um, built over the years and that we have been using steadily. There is no building here with the exception of one building, which I understand was closed for one year, when the declining enrollment uh, actually hit bottom and there wasn't any need for that extra space for, uh, I believe it was only one year, but that was before I was back into the system. The reason I'm taking the opportunity to review this with you is that I noticed in the paper on Saturday that it said the most expensive project that the Cape had ever faced. And I thought that it might be interesting to analyze a little bit just what the history of the commitment of Cape Elizabeth to school buildings, in fact, has been, and then to make the effort to translate that into $93 so that we can put this particular project into focus. Clearly, um, it would be wonderful to build a whole high school for $65 $5,000. You will see in my next slide that that does translate into slightly more if one takes a 93 uh, version of what those actual dollars were. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, and I don't know how visible this is on TV, but I don't want to take the time, you know, to read all of this uh, out loud, but it, it's really obvious that beginning in 1948, ending in 1962, that as um, Bill Jordan was telling me the other day in our conversation about this, it seems like almost every other year, some group had to get together to come up with a building just to house the kids that were coming through. It was an enormous influx and a very sudden uh, push for the need for space. Uh, you will notice that those figures are not very impressive by today's standards. It may look like a great bargain and that the total of the, uh, what it costs the town to, uh, to actually build the, pro the buildings that we're talking about redoing uh, is a total of $1,707,000. That's uh, taking out the 65000 I thought it might be interesting to translate that kind of commitment from the community for school buildings into $93. So I turned to the only person I know who can do that, Peter Leslie, 
and asked him to work on that, which he very kindly did. Uh, he says these are very conservative figures. If anybody wants to know uh, how he did it, he's more than willing to explain the process he used. In other words, these are not replication. We could not go out and build those buildings as they now stand for these dollars. It is a translation of the commitment of the community at that time into dollars uh, that we are now asking to give you some comparison of the kind of commitment we are asking. Uh, if you will notice that the, uh, on the bottom, it's a little hazy, it goes from zero to 12 million. Uh, the current high school built in 1970 stands out, uh, and actually we believe that figure is a little low. We think it is a lot closer to uh, well over uh, between 11 and 12 million. In other words, when the community built the high school in 1970, it was taking the kind, asking the kind of commitment from the community that we are now asking to rebuild two-thirds of the buildings that house two-thirds of our student population. The high school, of course, only holding four grades until we put the kindergarten. To look at that, to look at that a little bit uh, again, to try to get another perspective on that, the 1933-1962 multiple projects have resulted in the buildings that are currently housing grades one through eight. Approximately, and actually, I know that that's a conservative figure. It's probably a lot closer to uh, 10.5 or 11 million dollars because I left out one figure when I was adding it up. So it's well over 10. Um, million dollars. The 1993 proposed addition renovation project to bring the grades one through eight buildings into proper condition for the next 20 years at 11.6 then is really very much in proportion with the kind of commitment the community has made in the past. I would want to point out too that those buildings that we have been using all along are ranging in age from 30 to 60 years old without, as Paul's already pointed out, major capital improvement. The, again, uh, the 1968-1971 construction of the present high school cost in $1993 approximately $11 million. I don't believe you could replicate that building for that cost today. I believe it would cost closer to 12 to 13 but at the same time, that's what the commitment from the community at that time was. I do want to point out what's already been pointed out, but I think it bears repeating. There have been no major building projects for the Cape Elizabeth School since 1971, over 20 years. The only capital improvements in that time that are still ongoing are the roof repair, kindergarten renovation projects that account for the debt service currently in our budget. That figure is $216,716. Connie, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, temporary classrooms, mm -hmm. what about those in that figure? That might, because I wasn't here when that was done, and so I'll have to give you what my understanding is. Those yes, they're not included in the figure, are they? No, they're not, because in okay. fact, the, the situation on the, and I can shut this off. It's, anybody wants to see a rerun later. Um, the temporary classrooms, uh, as I understand it, were financed as a building project through the, uh, actually through the town. The schools are not allowed to to do that kind of thing unless they own them totally and we lease them by renting them from the town. That's a whole separate um, issue, um, but that debt service does include some of that figure. And so trying to summarize the points that I, I hope we have made this evening, well, even though this is a large project and one that does undeniably impact the tax rate, it is after 20 years of making do with these buildings that we are coming forward with this project. And in that 20 year time, there have been all kinds of making do issues. Uh, they are the kinds of things that range from the silly and the irritating to the serious. I am concerned about air quality control. I have seen enormous problems in maintaining our heating system. We had a panel in one of the classrooms last year that froze. It happened to have a fish in it. Uh, we have been able, by uh, extending, overexpending some of our maintenance service lines, to actually, in a band-aid way, take care of the worst of those problems so that I am assured that we are going to have no more fish freezing. But I can't absolutely assure that. Those systems are breaking down and they are costing us 
uh, band-aid kind of money to keep them going. There are issues uh, that most of the issues that have been uh, mentioned I think are important. I do want to add a couple of educational issues. K-8, the buildings that we're talking about, do not have any suitable science curriculum space. I think that's a serious issue. Uh, we have one very inadequate sink in our eighth grade lab that was originally 30 years ago built as a high school, actually built as a junior high lab originally, and the gas has long since been shut off and it would be unsafe for us to turn it back on. So there is no way that using the space we have without major renovation, we can in fact uh, address that issue because it's right through all of the buildings. There are numerous other issues like that that impact curriculum, and I certainly invite um, the community to come in for the Saturday tours and be happy to hold them at other times to try to show that. In closing, I would like to share with you um, a memo that one of the teachers sent me a couple of years ago from the seventh grade science trying to demonstrate just and from a teacher's point of view, how this was impacting the day-to-day -day time that was necessary to prepare lessons. Her point is, is that had there been or were there some kind of, of uh, what did she call it here, a science lab or co-located science labs with a prep room serviced by water, storing necessary supplies, would have greatly reduced the necessary setup time for this activity. So I'll close by simply reading you quickly what she had to say. Um, attached is a photocopy of an activity, something somewhat like a lab, that is part of the chemistry unit in the grade 7 text, General Science. It is a unique procedure that illustrates an important concept. It's visual, concrete, and takes about 10 minutes for the students to complete. I did this activity in my two sections of science last week. I'd like to give you, of course, anyone else who you think might be interested, an idea of what it took to prepare for this activity in my non-lab classroom in our antiquated building. Uh, she starts out by saying she did spend time conferring with colleagues, which is time she would spend anyway. Then since I have no science equipment or supplies in my classroom and no place to store such things, I spent the next 30 minutes moving the necessary items to my room. First I rolled the large card holding the safety goggle sterilizer down the hallway. Then I returned to the portable and picked up the box of safety aprons and brought those to my class. I walked back to Tom Mulder's class to get the seven test tube backs back down the hall to my room, then back to Tom's to pick up the plastic squeeze bottles, the bottles of peroxide, and the splints and matches, back to my room, then to the lock chemical closet in Ken Plummer's room to get the manganese dioxide back to my room. You got the picture. I skipped lunch that day so I could arrange the equipment and chemicals in easy to distribute groups. I have a period five language arts class followed by science with no setup time in between. After the lab period six, all the goggles had to be placed in a sterilizer for 15 minutes. Soil test tubes were placed in racks. Students were sent to the girls' restroom for water and paper towels so that the tables could be cleaned up. Period seven was repeated period six. Goggles were sterilized, tables washed, but this time all the soil test tubes, 32, were loaded into my bag for a trip home to my dishwasher. Unfortunately, the manganese dioxide adheres quite well and did not come out in the dishwasher. So I scrubbed each of the 32 test tubes in a sink of hot soapy water with an old toothbrush. I carted the glassware back the next day because Mr. Plummer was planning to do the same activity. Of course, all the equipment I'd carried to my room now had to be carried to his room. And as she points out, were there a proper lab um, and in that, uh, for that age grade level we would uh, typically see in any um, fairly up-to-date facility, some kind of station where those kinds of things are and where they can be taken care of. This, of course, is a homely little example, one that could be solved with far less than $11 million. The point is this is happening every day, all the time, and I simply ask how much of the time that goes into this kind of a, of making up for a poor facility is being taken away from the energy that we would like our teachers to be able to spend in working with children. Thank you. Thank you, Con. Paul, that take care of you? Okay. What we'd like to do now, and the uh, school committee chairman of the building committee has offered to take notes on it. We'd like to hear from as many people as possible, all of you, if you'd like to speak. Give me an idea now how many would like to speak tonight. Hold your hands up, will you? Way up. Come on. Don't be stiff, bashful. One, two, three. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'd like to hear from at least half a dozen or ten or twenty. What we'd like to do is have you come up to the microphone, give your name, your address, and 
whatever you'd like, what you think, or a question. If you do have a question, they're going to be copying it down, down here. We're going to try to save a little time this way. You listen to the questions out there, all of you, then when you're done with your questions, we'll let them appoint the person that they would like to answer that particular question. I think we'll get a lot further done that way. So let's start right over on this corner here. Come on up. Public hearing is on the school is now open. Um, my name is Paul McGuire, 8 Waven Road. Um, excuse me, I'm a little nervous. Um, I got to take the uh, school tour on Saturday. And uh, it was uh, pretty, uh, pointed out a lot of issues with the physical structure of the schools. Um, leaking roofs and uh, bad handicapped access, uh, poor air quality, uh, windows that don't open, um, stuffy rooms. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion in the tour about fixing these problems one by one. Um, you know, some paint or patch or paper. Uh, <clears throat> it was clear that <clears throat> uh, this approach has been taken for several years in the schools. I think it's characteristic of <clears throat> the, the magnitude of the problem uh, indicates that there's more than just that kind of approach that can deal with these issues. Uh, <clears throat> I think the raw numbers of the proposal are <clears throat> sure seem like a big percentage. But um, in fact, I think there's a jump because uh, <clears throat> these expenditures have been put off for quite a while. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we got plenty of cups, so don't the rest of you be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Next one from over here. Come on right up. Who had their hand up right there? Okay. And then the young lady right behind you. Let's go. Hi, it's Mark Casey, 18 Kildare Road. Um, I'm going to be real quick. I did want to uh, come up here and voice my support for the existing plan. Um, I think it's crucial. I do have two school-aged children. I have a third grader and a soon-to-be four-year-old. And uh, from aside from the, uh, the physical the physical conditions, I think it is important to incorporate um, the fine tradition educationally that this town has always had with a uh, with a physical plant to go along with it. And uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Don't have to write any questions down there, Paul. That was a good one. Young lady, right over here. Hello, my name is Suzanne Gannon. I'm from Nine Chevers Road. Um, I have a son that's in first grade, and he's my only, so this is my first um, experience with the Cape Elizabeth school system. Um, kindergarten was wonderful, and this year we're running into the situation with the school where I'm not real comfortable with him having to go over to the middle school for some of his specials. I'm concerned with his safety, the safety of the other children, the safety of the teachers, the volunteers, when I hear that windows are falling out, um, other things that seem amazing to me. Um, I feel our children don't have much of a voice in this, but we're requiring them to go into these buildings where I'm hearing that they're approaching being condemned. And I obviously support the construction. Um, I think safety should be our first priority. And I feel we should consider very seriously how we, w how we will feel personally if a child or an adult is hurt um, or maimed or worse. <coughs> and not only how we will feel, but how we will be viewed as a community. And also how, I don't have a legal background, but how does this affect us um, from a legal liability standpoint? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else over? Yes, sir. My name is David Clucci, and I live on Birch Knolls. I have three children in the Cape Elizabeth school system, two in the middle school, and one in Pond Cove Elementary. Uh, my daughter's fourth grade classroom is the room that I understand this window fell out of uh, this year when her teacher was opening it to try and air out the classroom before school began. It seems to me, from what I've seen in the middle, middle school, particularly the cafeteria and the restrooms, that uh, this project is long overdue. It at least has now come to be time to proceed with it. 
and so I would uh, I would strongly support the existing project. Thank you. Yes. A lot more coming up now than had their hands up before. <laughs> My name is Sherry Gillies and I live at 50 Scott Dyer Road. I have a um, child in first grade and one that will be going to school in three years. And it's um, very important to me that this is taken care of. I really feel that a lot of it's a, a safety issue and I fully support it. And I do have a question that I wanted to ask. And that is, have there been any plans made for the kindergarten to be put back with the Pond Cove School? They will answer that all together at the end. At the end, okay. okay. Um, I, I haven't fully uh, looked at all the plans, but I also wanted to find out about um, people would be walking in one side and driving in the other. Is that the understanding? No? Because I feel that's another safety issue, is I have a daughter that walks to school, and it's really quite dangerous trying to they have one crossing guard, and then they're crossing uh, another street and it's very busy so i'm concerned about that too thank you Thanks. yes sir right down here you didn't have your hand up before did you know <laughs> he did yes, yes he did george higgins 22 stonegate um i used to live um in another community nearby and we had young children we connected to cape because of its school system. And we, <coughs> because of that, moved here. Um, since then, we've had uh, four children either proceed through or still in the Cape school system. And I will tell you that it's what draw, drew us to Cape in the beginning, and, and it's the one factor that makes me most proud of being a Cape citizen, is the quality and reputation of our schools. Now, I will tell you that <coughs> We are no longer considered to be in a league on a, of our own in this regard, as you know. I think many communities around us have developed very excellent school systems. And I will tell you that I think there's a fair amount of competition for people moving in. Let me give you an example. Uh, I have an occasion to hire uh, professionals in my business. And the last three times that we've hired young uh, families, uh, they have chosen to move to Cape and move into Cape. And uh, I've been very proud of that. Uh, I will tell you that other communities north of here and west of here uh, are now competing for these very uh, good families who are moving in. And I believe that that's a lifeblood for our community. I think it's something we should strive to do. And I, I have concerns that the condition of the buildings as they continue will be a negative factor in choice. And I've seen that happen already. Uh, I think good teachers are invaluable, but I think good teachers in the right environment are better still. Uh, no one wants uh, new taxes, but I can't imagine anything I would rather continue to support in this town than its educational system. I had the opportunity a year ago to go to Scarborough High School and lecture to them about um, drug abuse issues. And I don't know how many have had the opportunity to see their new facility over there, uh, their, new, their center where, where they can sit in this auditorium. And it is, it, it's marvelous. And I was struck as I walked into this hall with 700 students and, and teachers of the immense pride that they took in this facility, incredible pride. And I, I had no doubts that this affected the learning environment, the enthusiasm of their teaching and learning. And um, I think that we should continue to strive to provide that to our children. I have a third grader. Um, I'm very pleased that she's here and being educated, and I will continue to be uh, pleased with her education. But I believe it's time to commit to making her environment and those of her, uh, her, her students, uh, co-students, uh, a better one. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else over on this side? All quiet back there? Yes. Yep. Barbara Shankle, 32 Belfield Road. 
I have no comments because I don't know enough yet. I have no children in the school system and never have. I haven't seen the plant and plan to go on one of the tours so I can make a reasoned, rational decision. But I do have a couple of questions to ask. Uh, I'd like to know whether in the plan space has been included for projected numbers of students. In other words, will there be empty space where there will be no students, but simply in anticipation of students to come? Second question I have, in terms of asbestos removal, and for anyone interested, and I'd like to give it to the appropriate person, I, there was an article in the New York Times speaking about the fear of asbestos perhaps being overblown, and it relates to New York. And I'd like to give that, I don't know whether it would be you, Mike, or someone else, Paul, the article about the asbestos, whether that will have any bearing or not. I don't know what the federal regulations are. But is the, does the asbestos removal, is it will, will it be removed in more than the areas that are affected by the construction? And my last question is, Connie Goldman referred to the cost to repair uh, the, the structure itself and things like the heating system, the systems in the building. And I'd like to have some idea of what that is running approximately per year for the last couple of years, what it will run in the next couple of years, just estimates, and whether or not that will be reducing the budget, the <coughs> school budget, so that Although we are paying so much for the school, we will see a reduction in the operating budget of the school, which will in turn reduce our taxes a little bit. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think the school committee has done a fine job on working on this. Anybody else on the left side here? Okay, let's start over here. Who is the first one down here? Right there, come on. <coughs> Uh, I'm Tom Wright from One Pine Ridge Road, and uh, I did attend the um, uh, the Saturday uh, review of the school. I have <coughs> a number of concerns were brought out during that, and I think that they were noted, but I wanted to kind of key point some of them. Uh, first of all, I think that the concept of having a school that's safe um, and is, has the right educational environment for our kids is very important. I think that the way, uh, I, I, think, I think one problem here is that we may be in a number of these uh, renovations or <coughs> the costs here seem to be solutions that are too expensive. Uh, one example that was pointed out were the three temporary buildings. The permits possibly can be renewed, so they may not have to be replaced. Another point was the air quality. Uh, a, a new system could be put in for uh, a, a, low co a, a relatively low cost and it seemed to be a lot lower than what we were talking about. Um, electrical systems up to code, I mean, I'd like to know what parts of it, are there parts of this building that have to be replaced? I think the, the most important thing is safety, and the second, of course, most important thing is the quality of education in the schools. <laughs> Um, <coughs> we talked about the heating system. It was pointed out that it is not uncommon to have a, uh, one heating system for two buildings. Um, the science center is, I'm not sure, you know, how much has to be spent to get a science uh, lab to the level that's required for, for the 6th, 7th, and 8th grades. Uh, <clears throat> another concern I have is, I, I, I'm sitting here now, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth are sitting here now, 
with unfortunately very, very little information about this, uh, this $11.6 million project. We have the same concerns of having the best education for our kids and safety in the schools. We do not, ha very few people have any information on this project. How can we possibly make any kind of vote for or against this project? So I think it's very important that the information gets out. And I think that it should be fair. I think we should show the alternatives, some of the less expensive alternatives uh, that, that may be pointed out. The architectural firm has burned us for $700,000. Do people know that? Um, $700,000. Uh, well, yeah, that is, that's the total cost of the, the cost and the cost at the end. Is that correct? They'll answer it when you're all done. So yes. Yeah. Um, I did see another thing in the building that I was, that I felt had to be corrected. But again, uh, I think there was, I think there are solutions other than wiping out entire buildings like the entire D wing. I think uh, we have a situation here where I feel very uncomfortable, and I think as taxpayers, people should be un un uncomfortable by not knowing much about this project. They also don't know what the tax bills are going to be. How can we vote on something if we don't know what our taxes are going to be when the new tax bills come out next year? I think it's been said that uh, the rates, people may not have a change in their rates. Um, that remains to be seen. So I think that we need some major information out to the public, and I would like to see those alternatives, and they were noted during the uh, session Saturday. I'd like to look at those, have those alternatives noted. Maybe this uh, project can be pared down, and I also did not get a figure on how much this is really going to cost, uh, what the quote the average taxpayer is, the average taxpayer has a, an assessment of $153,000 for their house. And I didn't get a either. It wasn't clear in the paper. I think, I think it's a lot of people have thrown in through a lot of time. I think that uh, let's look and see how we can maybe pick it down and get the same effect and you have the best school system possible without spending the great amount of money we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Over here, next one. Please. Now, don't think anybody that comes up that we're trying to hurry it through, because they're going to answer every one of these questions if we have to stay here till 11. If we do, I'll have something to say to some of them. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Michael Roy. I live at 51 Hillcrest Road. <clears throat> and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of this proposal for three broad reasons. Uh, one is I'm a concerned parent. The other is that I'm a concerned taxpayer and property owner, and finally I'm a member of the building committee. So, and I'll address that up front because I don't want to spend very much time about my role in the building committee, but I do want to say a few comments. First of all, the, I wanted to speak about the process we went through in some, in, in a little bit of detail. I thought that first of all, the committee as selected was very well balanced and representative of the community. And I think that everybody came to their work in a very serious way. Furthermore, the committee uh, was vastly benefited by the experience in architecture and in construction of several of its members. 
And this, along with the expertise that SMRT and our teachers and Connie Goldman brought to the committee, was very, very important in coming to the, I think, the excellent solution we came to. At the outset, the priority was to devise a solution that was fiscally responsible. And I just have to stress that over and over again, that came up time and again through the design process. This is a no-frills approach, but it's a no-frills approach that has to address a multiplicity of different uh, structural, program, and site-related issues. It was amazingly complex how all these things had to come together. And I hear the concerns about paring this down and about um, why does it have to be such a big project. But when you start to look at how everything is interrelated, it's really impossible to do it otherwise. In fact, much of the design process, surprisingly, was influenced by the site issues that were involved here. Uh, the, and, and the safety concerns that those site issues raised. Because of the uh, fiscal restrictions we had to work with, or we felt we had to work with, the committee was very strongly committed to rehab of any existing structures that could be rehabbed and limiting the amount of new construction as much as possible. Finally, I would say that SMRT, our architectural consultants, function very much as facilitators of this process. Uh, but I would stress that the major decisions were made by the committee itself. Next, I'd like to speak in my role as a taxpayer and property owner. Uh, as George Higgins said earlier, nobody wants to pay higher taxes. I certainly don't want to pay higher taxes. But as a community, we have an obligation to provide safe, comfortable school buildings that support a modern day program. Any school building project that we come up with has to meet those goals and be fiscally responsible, and I think that this project does just that. Another point historically I'd like to make is that we as taxpayers in Cape Elizabeth have had a free ride, and I think Connie Goldman pointed this out earlier. The last major building project in this town was 20, over 20 years ago. What space needs we've had, we've addressed with temporary portable structures that are now at the end of their lifespan. Most importantly, a policy of chronically deferred maintenance and a lack of any ongoing rehab, rebuilding program is what has led us to this crisis. The time has come to pay the piper, really. I would also point out that as taxpayers and property owners, we benefit from having high quality school programs and high quality school buildings. Cape Elizabeth property values are enhanced by the reputation of our school system. The current crisis threatens that reputation and it's going to inevitably erode those property values. Other communities are building attractive new schools and developing new programs that's only going to add to the problem and add to the competition. I'd next like to talk as a parent, as a very concerned parent. I have two children in Pond Cove and one who will be getting there in the next couple of years. And even as a casual observer, going to open houses, uh, attending various school functions, it's obvious the problems that exist. The overcrowding is one major problem. The problems with circulation, uh, the poor design of the buildings, uh, the lack of storage. You walk into a classroom and you fear for your life that something stacked 10 feet in the air is going to fall on you. Uh, there are, you just have to spend some time at 2.30 in the afternoon sitting in your car in that mall in the middle of the two schools to realize what the safety issues are. Heart. <clears throat> here are. You're bringing together buses, cars, and little kids. That's not a good prescription. I would say to summarize the existing uh, conditions problem, I think it's ultimately crucial that anybody who's going to vote in good conscience in this election, if, this, if the town council sees fit to move this to referendum, uh, really should take uh, the school tour, should read the existing conditions summary, and should attend the public meetings we have planned. I'm not saying that good buildings make good schools. That's not the point I'm making. But the academic program and the physical and the uh, physical plant are very closely linked. I was shocked this year when my son's third last year when my son's third grade teacher informed me that there is no organized science curriculum for the elementary grades because there is no space for that curriculum, as you've heard earlier. And that just absolutely shocks me. Some say that we have the best schools in Maine. That would be okay if, we, if our kids could grow up, find good jobs, and settle down here in the state. But you all know that's getting harder and harder to do. Our kids are going to have to compete nationally and even internationally. Fixing these schools will help them to do just that. 
In conclusion, I, I would urge that all Cape residents consider this project very seriously. Read the existing conditions summary, become familiar with the design solution as outlined, and most of all, attend that school tour. We in Cape Elizabeth have benefited in many ways from our high quality schools. We pride ourselves on our schools. Uh, aside from the lighthouse, it's really our community signature. We should come together as a community, look beyond the what's in it for me mentality, and do what's right for the greater good. And I think very strongly that as far as the schools are concerned, it's time for Cape Elizabeth to put its money where its mouth is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. We didn't leave much, Mike, for anybody else to say, but there's... <laughs> I got somebody coming. Oh, they're going away. Here we go. Carl, I'll get to you. Gene Attucks, Five Locksley Road. Um, I'm here as a taxpayer and a parent of a fifth grader and an eighth grader, but also of a teacher who just went through reconstruction and building as the connector classroom. Um, a few questions I have as far as money is concerned. Not only are we talking about the referendum for the town, but there are state referendums and county referendums that will also be of issue in November. I have uh, information here that I got this summer that is Town of Cape Elizabeth fiscal year 1994 budget, the adopted budget, which states that for our county expenditures, there was a 25.28% increase. So we're starting to pay for that jail. I'd like to know what else will be facing us. We have excellent town services in the community, and I think we would like to uphold them. How will we manage those salary increases, the benefits, the cost of living, and how will we keep the staff in the school that we're building? My questions are, are we looking at the cost of new buildings only? Are we looking at new furnishings? Do we, in fact, have the maintenance equipment provided at this point in time for the new buildings, or will that be an expense? If we have computer labs, science labs, will we, will we also be looking for further enhancing education and bringing on board new staff so that we can use these facilities to their best advantage? So my question is, at 11.6 million, at what expense? The community that I'm in for teaching has, we have new buildings. And we have the rooms that you people are speaking of. The expense was libraries with no librarians, rooms for social worker and guidance people, no social worker, no guidance people. We are hardwired for computers throughout the buildings, no computer educators. You people are raising issues of safety in your buildings at this point in time. When you are under construction and you people are talking years, I had one year, you're talking years, I'm going to encourage each of you to drive past the Viking nursing home. And I want you to look at the equipment that, that is on their grounds. There are um, the backs of tractor trailer trucks for supplies. There is a portable trailer for um, architects or job supervisors or clerk of the works. There are orange fencings for safety fencings for children. We have what we call the corral for playground for 150 children. And it was similar to the structure that you'll see at the Viking. Unlike the structure that you see at Pond Cove Media Center, that was a stick-built portable that arrived over summer, this is not going to arrive over summer. It's going to take years. Your children will be impacted. It's true. It will go on. And there'll be emergency fire exits shifting from day to day. We had contingency plans in places that were used. We had um, emergency plans that we had to evacuate, whether it was fumes or a piece of equipment. There were changes in plan. We had to leave our buildings. So teachers had boxes. And Connie, I can appreciate her talking about her science program, but imagine a whole day with your classroom somewhere else. I do look with two children at the middle school. There are certainly 
things that I do believe are not right about that building and something needs to be done. But I do ask that you look at the cost of this. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next over here? Well, you're on that side, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chapel. Some of the speakers raised more questions and I felt I needed to comment. I'm Judy Lardner from Four Pilot Point Road. It's my understanding that this project is a safety first project. And given the tax situation we have now, I support that and I do not support any frills. What the last speaker was commenting about is perhaps future staffing or equipment needs and certainly safety problems when this is under construction. If not now, when? If we wait because we can't afford staffing or equipment, if that's an issue, when will we ever? It seems to me if we do have the staffing and we can do the building, wonderful. If we build the building and we have the space for enhanced programming, then we can pay for the staffing and the equipment when we can. With respect to safety, I certainly wasn't an elementary student when this happened, but I went and was going through college with major construction and you deal with it. Um, these people would have tremendous liability and there would be fencing. And if we don't do the construction again, if not now, when? That will always be an issue unless we're going to acquire or pay, perhaps use the um, town property by the dump to build new schools completely. So while I certainly share those concerns, I would trust the school department to um, safeguard this or ensure the safety of my children and if not they'll be hearing from me because I care about my children just like anyone else does. Um, I guess some questions now is as I said it is my understanding that these are the bare essentials that we need in the sense of building. Um, I'd like somebody to confirm that if not perhaps identify any frills in this plan that could be cut if you can shave the cost you know, $300,000, it may take that to get the referendum through. Um, with respect to taxes, I think that perhaps this is the time for sacrifice. I know it's not an easy time. I know people in this community, and it may be unusual nowadays, but there are a lot of people hurting, and that extra $2 on the tax rate may really hurt some people. First, I would suggest that I understand that there are tax rebate programs and I don't know what either state, county, or um, local assistance is available, but this may be the time to educate our citizenry, if they need that, what they can get. Um, secondly, I'd like to ask perhaps Mike McGovern that if we can get this referendum passed, are there <coughs> any creative, administrative, or financial things you can do to perhaps lessen the severity of the tax impact if things can be juggled and shifted to perhaps help the citizens that are in trouble now? Um, I guess my last question would be, as I understand on this building committee there were some very fiscally conservative people. I think the kind of people that might be in the audience or at home saying, no way. And I'd like someone to get up here and testify why you're now saying yes. If there were problems, what has convinced you and why is this a fiscally conservative plan? And finally, if there really is a question for the council, I certainly urge you to put this to referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. What, two at once? Two at once. She needs moral support. <laughs> I'm a seventh grader in the middle school, and on the first day of school, I was walking up the stairs and not fooling around, and I hit my head <laughs> on a heater, and I had a headache for the rest of the day, and I felt dizzy. Um, we're here. I'm Karen Palin, and I live at 32 Old Fort Road. This is my daughter, Amy, who, as she just told you, is a seventh grader. And we feel that there are some safety issues that concern the students on a day-to-day -day basis. Amy spends a lot of time in the portables and often comes home not feeling very well because of the ventilation. I have a third grader who, when he was in first grade, spent a number of winter days sitting with his coat in the hallway because his classrooms in Pine Cove were too cold for instruction to be carried out. Um, this year, the seventh graders were instructed not to drink out of particular water fountains because of the possibility of metals. I would just ask you seriously to consider 
the types of situations we're putting our community's children in every day. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jill Mallory. I live at 11 Gladys Road, and I have a second grader and a um, little girl who will be in kindergarten next year. Um, I didn't know whether I was going to get up and say anything tonight. Uh, I guess the one point I wanted to make was I've had the opportunity um, over the past um, summer to attend some of the building committee meetings. And I would like to say to anyone that has any doubt as to whether um, the committee spent um, time and effort considering how to pare this down, that that was done at every available um, opportunity. I heard at all the meetings that I attended, is this, is this the best we can do with um, the space that we've got? Are we, do we have two more square feet than we really need? Um, there were continual questions like this about every um, facet that the committee was discussing, and I was very impressed by that, that the te even the teachers that were um, present on advisory um, basis were willing to look at, th at this in a reasonable light and not be asking for the moon. Um, so I really think that we've um, put band-aids on these buildings for long enough. I think that um, continuing to address situations on a um, non-related basis, just looking at, well, what we need to do for electrical in this part of the building and what we need to do for science in this part of the building is just putting more band-aids on it and um, may, may end up costing even more in the long run. Um, the building committee's done a tremendous job in looking at the best way to solve all the problems in, with the least amount of cost for Cape Elizabeth at this time. So I would um, urge everyone to take the tours, and um, I heartily support the project. Thank you. The six hands that I had at the start of this uh, public hearing at 8 o'clock has now grown to 14. Who'd like to make it 15? There we go. Come on. <laughs> Jim Gubner, 557 Ocean House Road. Um, as a I'm coming here as a parent, as an engineer, and as a taxpayer. Um, as a parent, I'm behind a project. Um, as an engineer, I do budget estimates all the time. Um, I notice this is a preliminary budget, es budget estimate. I'm assuming there will be a final budget estimate. Um, I see in the paragraph B, the contingency is 10%. I'm assuming that's the accuracy of this estimate. Usually preliminaries are plus or minus 25%. Um, are we in the high end or the low end? Um, what I'm getting at, when I do an estimate for a client, I will tend to be conservative and high and then try to look like a hero when it comes in under budget rather than come in low to get the job and then get a phone call because uh, we've got a few extras here. We didn't count on this. We didn't count on that. Um, so I'm not... I guess it's not really a question. I just want to make sure we feel good about these numbers um, because uh, there'll be a lot of screaming and yelling and phone calls, I'm sure, if uh, at the end of the road the, uh, we didn't borrow enough money and we have to go back for more. Thank you. Thank you. 16? Mr. Chairman and members of the council, my name is Joel Russ. I live at 28 Rocky Hill Road. Uh, I've been a resident of Cape Elizabeth for 47 years with a few minor uh, uh, excursions outside the area. Um, I represent an organization uh, that has identified education, training, and retraining as one of its most uh, important goals over the next several years. Uh, and I'm very pleased by the response of the communities in the greater Portland area uh, to the need for uh, increased excellence in education. Uh, and I hope that Cape Elizabeth continues to move forward in its own um, uh, tradition of excellence uh, in education. 
I'm also here as uh, a parent of two boys uh, who were extremely well served by this Cape Elizabeth school system. Uh, I'm an empty nester now, but can believe that I continue to have an obligation to support the future education of those children who are coming along. I, like a lot of people in this audience, uh, do not have uh, all the details of the proposed project in my mind, but I'm in the process of learning more about those uh, over the next several weeks. What I do know is that the public officials in this community and the citizens do not act impulsively, that the major public improvements that have been made in this community, since I can remember, have been the result of careful study, a thoughtful process, and that the final decisions have been intelligent. I think the decision that you have to make is whether or not to allow the citizens of the town of Cape Elizabeth the opportunity to express their good judgment uh, based on the fine work that's been done by so many people over the next three years. And I would urge you to vote to allow the citizens the opportunity uh, to express that judgment. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, you've been up here once, sir. Would you just take a seat there till I get through the group, and then I'll see you, okay? Anybody else that hasn't spoken? Carl, are you going to say something? I'm not going to wait any longer. <laughs> Carl Pearson, 8 Russet Lane. Uh, I was going to say, first of all, I'll get right to the point. I urge you to pass this on for the consideration of the voters in the referendum in November. Uh, one question I do have to the architects and the parties that be here uh, is I'm in full support if you also throw in there some consideration to completely redo the facade of that beautiful Pond Cove School. Uh, and I wish uh, Mr. Stevens was here because I know his uh, dad designed that back in the early 50s. And yeah. He is. Oh, yes. Okay. I see you hiding. Uh, and I'm sure it's beautiful then. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I also am uh, up here, you know, the more I hear, the, the more I get concerned. And uh, I was on the original School Space Study Committee, which preceded this building committee. And uh, I wasn't there as many hours as some of the other committee members because it only took me my first walk through that building to say, this is atrocious. Uh, and yes, I'm also uh, conservative in some respects, especially when it comes to creative uh, uh, solutions for different problems. And I looked at it and said, boy, there's a lot of things that can be done. And, uh, but I'm also one that likes to uh, have new things because they're easy to maintain. Uh, 20 years, uh, this is going to last. And, and uh, I, I think it's foolish not to go ahead with it. Uh, there's just so many. Th I'm, I'm trying to throw out different thoughts here. One is uh, everyone doesn't want to pay more taxes. I'd rather pay more taxes knowing it's to enhance a town asset which benefits everyone. If we decided to sell out Cape Elizabeth and all leave, uh, that building's going to be a heck of a lot better for all of us to divvy up if it's in good shape. Right now, it's not worth a heck of a lot. It's an albatross, and it'd be tough to get rid of. Uh, so I always like to enhance the assets, which you can offset any borrowing against. Uh, I wish I came up before uh, Mike Roy, too, because he had a wonderful speech, but uh, that was wonderful. Um, he had one comment in the end there, too, about putting your money where your mouth is, and dovetailing that on the comments about do we have beautiful facilities with nothing to fill them? Do we hardwire and have no computers? I think putting your money where your mouth is and also the community-based uh, uh, feelings in this particular town uh, would be very well uh, addressed by the person coming and saying, we don't have computers for the computer lab. Uh, Mr. Higgins spoke about uh, bringing in a lot of executives. I'm not sure what Mr. Higgins is affiliated, but there's a lot of management in Cape Elizabeth who could say, well, such and such corporation will donate the computers to that computer lab. And there you have a creative solution to a problem. It's not going <coughs> to affect the tax dollar. Uh, there's a lot of solutions that have been done like that at the library. No books, you donate a book. There's a lot more that can be done. If you look at the benefit, a lot of people that have more than one child or two, child, two children in the school system, and you look at the cost per pupil and say, boy, I'm getting a $10,000 benefit for two or $3,000 in taxes, 
I think I can fork over a little more money here and make it a donation. It's still tax deductible. Uh, so I think there's a lot of solutions. I think the, the important thing right now is to advance this to the uh, referendum vote in November. And between now and then, I know there's going to be plenty of public hearings to address all the comments and concerns that were made tonight. And I have faith in the committee and the town council. And I thank you. Thank you, Council. Anybody else? Are we all done? Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm uh, Rick Preddy. I live at 19 Manta Road. <coughs> I'm not uh, going to throw out a lot of emotionalism on this because I've got four children in the middle school right now, and um, I think that uh, the conditions there are, are pretty poor. But uh, and they have been that way for a long time. In fact, uh, I was a student in the school and it hasn't changed much since. And in fact, I was a student in this building at one point, so I know there's some uh, aged buildings in this town and they need our support. However, I'm somewhat uh, dismayed at the uh, town government and the school committee for trying to create a massive tax increase on the citizens of this community prior to any release of information on reevaluation of property in this town. And uh, I think it's a, it's a, we have to question the integrity of the whole project based on that alone and not worry about whether people are um, in conditions that perhaps might not be uh, absolutely modern at this point. So if uh, the town council has any political integrity with respect to the financial issues, they should take a real close look at the impact they're going to draw on this community today and for the next 20 years on top of three to five percent increases they've had since I've moved back into the community since 1988, where my taxes have gone up $1,600 in that, in, that, in that one period. And uh, I don't see the trend discontinuing at all. I see based on current spending patterns and I see based on current political thought within this community, three to five percent increases happening year after year after year. And I think it needs to level off somewhat I don't see this as being a good leveling off point at all, particularly before revaluation. Now, South Portland went through a revaluation recently. A lot of citizenry there had huge increases, 20, 30, 40 percent in many cases. In Portland, a couple of years ago, same thing, revaluation. And well, that burden fell very, very heavily on people that were caught in the market conditions of the time where their home <coughs> appeared based on market conditions to have increased valuation. Now, I'm real surprised that, um, again, this is being promoted heavily and pushed through pro four to five months prior to revaluation being, um, well, I should say that the numbers being public after the revaluation is completed. Now, it would be prudent and I think a decent thing to do to wait till revaluation is concluded before we go to the community and ask for an 11 to 15 million dollar increase because I'm not a great believer that construction projects are going to fall firmly on the number that was quoted out of the starting gate. Um, I, I just think that it, it, we have to question the integrity of the whole process based on that one position. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes. I'm Carla Bernstein, 1920 Road, and I really was not going to speak tonight, and I know it's getting late, but I feel now I have to make two very brief comments. The first is one earlier comment about can't we just build a science lab and repair some wires here, and um, that sort of thing. I think that's just a continuation of the patchwork approach that's been going on already continually, and it's time to stop the patchwork approach. That's been said many times tonight. Uh, secondly, with regard to the taxes, I already figured out my own tax increase based on a $2 um, increase, and that would be a $500 increase on my own taxes, which is a big hunk, and that's without revaluation, which is going to raise it an unknown amount. But 
my point, the way I feel, and I'm sure a lot of other people do, whether my tax rate increases $2 per thousand or $5 per thousand, if you're really for this, you're going to be for it. I'm not going to not vote for it because the revaluation gives me two extra dollars more per thousand. There is no choice with the schools. And if they're not fixed now, they have to be fixed sometime, and it's going to be a lot more than two dollars per thousand ten years from now or eight years from now. Um, there must be reasons for the timing. I'm sure there's reasons for the timing. There were committees in place. That's what committees are for. That's what government is for. And um, I don't want to belabor it, but I just feel that it's a vital project, and whether it's $2 per thousand or $4 per thousand, it has to be done. The revaluation is going to happen anyway, and the schools have to be fixed anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? We're all done at 19? That's good. Sir, I'm willing to hear you as long as it's not a rebuttal against anything that anybody said, and you have a new question. Yes. Uh, just to, I need to add a few things. Yes, certainly. Uh, I want to know why the schools have been left in the condition that they have for the last 20 years. And this new plan but to make sure we have a good facilities engineer or whoever we call it. And that person is totally on top of this and I want a committee of some sort to make sure this new building stays up to snuff, if it is passed. Um, I heard about no organized science curriculum because of a, of a facility problem. When we were in school, we didn't have labs. I know you're supposed to have labs, but I think that it's, a, it's a, another issue, but I can't, I, we cannot blame facilities on having no curriculum or having uh, a curriculum that is not up to snuff where it should be. And I, I, I think this is another thing people have to look at, and that is the whole, the curriculum in some of the, some of the schools. If you want a top school, you want a top curriculum. And facilities do not make curriculums. Teachers and students make curriculums. People have to know the details of this plan. It may, we do, we are having a situation where there is, Yarmouth is a community a lot of people are settling in because of the high taxes in Cape Elizabeth. I've seen it all over. They are, CMP, pays for half the taxes of Europe. So you may see an outflux of people from Cape Elizabeth if you start get the taxes too high. And it's not just this project. I would like a project like this to go through. Let's make it fiscally responsible. Let's make it a, a good program. Let's look at the Let's get a cost-benefit uh, cost uh, statement out for the next 20 years. I don't think things have been cut the way they should. And people are making statements tonight saying that they're for it without, with very, very little information. So the next few months, let's get that information out and let's get the feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. That uh, closes our public hearing. Uh, on the elementary and middle school improvement program, and we'll move right on to item. Questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Questions, I was going to close it. You want to say some more questions? I was hoping to get right on to item 53. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> you stop me. Go ahead. Now, don't lose the group here because this is going to be the answer to the questions that you brought up. Let's not see you walking out up there. I certainly won't be able to answer every single question for you, but we have technical people here from SMRT to answer those technical questions. Uh, certainly Connie can fill in on the administration part of it. Um, I would like to address uh, the budget. Uh, as you know, this is a concept plan. Uh, we went
went through a long period to go through and present to you a detailed analysis. Uh, it was not available to us at the beginning of the process. We took one step at a time, uh, always uh, considering the fact of, of uh, the cost impact to the community. Uh, myself in particular, our children are out of the school system. Our daughter just graduated this past year. Uh, we, have no, we are now empty nesters, as Joel is, and uh, uh, we feel that it's very important for the for the community uh, to have this uh, school project. Uh, the budget as it's presented is for a concept plan. Uh, this is the concept. It needs your input. It needs additional engineering uh, to be able to fine tune it. Uh, we have not gotten into all of the actual details of wall systems and curtain walls and replacement. Uh, we have addressed those issues in a general sense uh, and have applied uh, with the, the architects uh, input, uh, square foot numbers and, and uh, typical construction costs for what we are in fact doing. Uh, by having new construction in, in uh, major renovations uh, just on construction dollars as you would go out to bid for that particular item of work, renovations for example are $45 a square foot versus new construction at 75 that in itself, if we were to replace that, we'd have to, be, we'd have to pay about $75 per square foot. This budget tries to anticipate all of the effects of the program. It does not, uh, we have not added new programs uh, within the, the uh, plan uh, that's presented. Uh, we have projected uh, figures for the next, I wouldn't say 20 years, but I think it's is 10 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, for the enrollment projections, we had market research do uh, an update on their analysis for our, for our enrollment projections, and we have incorporated that. Uh, the budget, uh, we feel, is reasonable. Our task, once we get beyond the referendum, uh, is to detail all of the aspects of the, of the project and then prepare detailed cost estimates uh, that, ref that will basically come into this projected cost. If we can save some additional dollars, that's in fact what we are uh, going to do. Uh, we won't know that until this job actually goes out to bid uh, in where it stands. One of the basic aspects that we have not even anticipated in, a, in, in this particular plan at this time is to look at areas for alternative uh, methods to put in a bid package. That is way down the road uh, and it will give us some choices when the final numbers come in. Uh, the one, one comment that was brought out as far as the cost for architectural services, uh, I would say that, that we have hired SMRT for this design concept. Uh, we have no contract, no commitment for SMRT for the next stage. Uh, the, uh, this is something that that decision will have to be made as we go forward. Uh, the architectural fees and services is for design. It's a $700,000 budgeted value. It has not been uh, dedicated to anyone. It is strictly a budget. Uh, we have not entered into contract negotiations. And I can assure you that the experience that SMRT has had uh, is they're going to have to fight to get $700,000. Uh, but that is uh, something that, that we uh, will negotiate down the road, uh, as will most of these items. As far as the traffic pattern, uh, maybe I could have Art uh, briefly go through the uh, uh, site plan. That was one of the questions raised. The, uh, site plan. Site plan that is shown here uh, on this small drawing here uh, with Scott Dyer Road, Route 77, the high school. Uh, this is the existing elementary school, the existing middle school. Uh, this site plan separates the circulation for the automobiles and the bus traffic. 
bus traffic comes in on Jordan Way, picks up and drops off at the front door of the elementary school and the middle school, and then exits the site, uh, picking up and dropping off kindergarten at the high school. It exits at the high school. Automobile traffic arrives and leaves uh, the site off Scott Dyer with again a drop off and pick up location here and the majority of the parking for the staff, visitors in the community who come to the school are located here on the south end of the uh, uh, existing campus. So in effect, the design does reorient the major entrance to this facility to the south integrating this facility into the whole of Cape Elizabeth campus, education campus, if you will. We have also uh, discussed and had several uh, uh, op opportunities to develop different options for the access points and, and some limited parking on the north end uh, of the existing facility. And this concept drawing here really was developed in response to some planning board concerns about continued uh, options to drop off and pick up uh, uh, students here. But again, this activity would be separate from all of the bus activity. It would be limited, and there would be limited staff parking located at that location as well. A question for the kindergarten, uh, moving back to the Pond Cove. Uh, at this time, we have not prepared any uh, or made any provisions to actually move the kindergarten back to the to the uh, uh, Pond Cove School. Uh, part of the uh, space study committee, uh, and after that report, uh, it was implemented as far as moving the uh, kindergarten to the high school. Uh, and to our knowledge, at this point, and that's the way we've been. Uh, Boeing and Connie could uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, no plans are made for that, no, no provisions made for that. Thank you. Um, the kindergarten issue is really tied to what happens in overall enrollment. I thought it was interesting to see a report last week, and I haven't seen it in anything more than surface report, that last year, or, or within the last year or two, we're beginning to see the signs of a decline in the birth rate. Uh, that is going to show up in school enrollments. Uh, for instance, what we've been dealing with for the last eight or nine years uh, is kind of popularly known as a baby boomlet. The children of the baby boomers. And since the children of the baby boomers are now into the low end of that particular bulge in the population, it's quite predictable that there will be some kind of effect by having fewer women of childbearing age at, um, in the population that will probably create some kind of a shadow uh, dip in enrollment just as we saw in the 70s. As, as we point out, this is not a straight enrollment issue. The baby boom has created a wave. We're seeing the repercussions of that wave. And I think it's arguable that we will eventually, perhaps in the next few years, see uh, an additional shadow of the wave that shut down schools in the, uh, in the 70s. However, our figures do not show that yet. We do not know exactly. We've been uh, working with the advice to keep watching the birth rate and see what the correlations are. Um, what we have done is to make sure that the high school is large enough to take care of the increased enrollment moving up through the high school and still carry the kindergarten um, that, has, that we have actual place there. Uh, that certainly is a pattern we see for the foreseeable time. We have some capacity to deal with some increased enrollments, but if we were to take the enrollment as a steady factor, as far as we could see, and add enough rooms for the kindergarten, we would greatly increase the cost of this project. Um, it was part of the cost effectiveness of this, uh, as I think it was Mike Roy said, there were so many interconnected pieces. Uh, so that's the long explanation. The short explanation is we expect to leave the kindergarten where it is unless we see a decline in enrollment. There was concern regarding safety uh, during construction. Uh, that is certainly uh, a major consideration of any contractor, uh, an architect, and owner uh, during uh, a construction period. 
what we attempted to do, and we do have a phasing plan in our report, and I won't get into the complete detail on that due to time uh, constraints tonight, but certainly uh, would like you to familiarize yourself with that. Uh, and we did a thorough analysis of the actual phasing in order to, to minimize the impact on either school so that uh, Pond Cove actually goes through uh, one school term uh, with major disruption uh, and uh, middle school goes through one school term with major disruption. Uh, there is going to be work that happens during the summer uh, sessions or no sessions uh, during the summer recess uh, so that there is uh, no impact uh, there. Uh, granted, the courtyard area where construction activity has to uh, occur uh, will have to be cordoned off and, and we do have uh, uh, provisions to accommodate uh, for the safety of the children. That needs to be worked out in far more detail uh, and certainly would be uh, done during the next stage. Um, I can assure you I'm in the construction business and I've built many schools. Uh, one major uh, renovation and addition project that I was involved in, and actually Connie was involved in, uh, it was in Gorham, at the Gorham Village Elementary School. And uh, that was a, a, a big concern of ours, uh, and it uh, actually went extremely smoothly. Uh, to our uh, surprise, uh, what we found is the uh, students were, were in, thrilled by uh, the activity going on, the teachers were bringing uh, the actual construction uh, stages into their classroom and, and actually incorporating that into their programs. Uh, and we saw all kinds of pictures throughout uh, for various stages of, of construction and, and uh, it was just absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I think that, that that's the type of effort that, that uh, with the proper design team uh, in Boulder, uh, we certainly can uh, have a safe construction period. It's certainly not going to go without uh, some difficulty and some inconvenience, uh, but certainly we have to be faced with that at some point in time. Um, as far as the, the there was mention uh, of keeping temporary buildings, uh, the temporary buildings that we have are really uh, are, are, compl are built as a minimum standard. Uh, they're they're thrown up. Uh, and uh, this, this state has gone through for the last um, probably 10 years uh, all of a sudden a portable classroom uh, phase where every school in, I think in the, in the state had portable classrooms uh, and it was certainly uh, or it certainly helped to alleviate some of the overcrowding uh, that all school districts are faced with. They've also had many problems with these. We're no exception. Uh, in these schools, uh, these buildings are substandard. They're not made, they're on post, uh, they're wood frame construction. Uh, they certainly cannot meet uh, code uh, when it comes to putting students in its place. The only reason we can do it uh, is the fact that they are, in fact, temporary type buildings. As far as the tax uh, uh, questions, I probably would defer that to uh, uh, Mike uh, because he has the more detailed information on that. Mike. Yeah. Based on an $11.7 million budget uh, and a 20-year borrowing at the rate of 6%, uh, that's probably a little bit high in today's market, but by the time we got around to doing the borrowing, it, it might be up at that level. Uh, the impact would be accumulative probably over two years of two dollars and seventeen cents per thousand, or the average of a dollar eight and one oh eight and a half cents per year. Uh, the tax rate percent uh, for the individual from the current tax rate would be twelve point two six percent. Again, that would be spread out over uh, two years. The impact on the average taxpayer of that person with the hundred and fifty thousand, hundred and fifty three thousand dollar home would be three hundred and thirty two dollars and one cents increase spread over two years. Thank you. The, uh, there was a question uh, regarding. Uh, is, yes. Is that end after two years? No. 20. Perhaps is that the third year to the 20th year? The. If I'd like to go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the. 
that is the entire debt service cost. I think Mr. Liberty can answer the question as to how, and I think he has a little bit on what happens with operating costs, but this would assume the, the entire burden of the debt and that extra jet revenue that would be generated would support uh, the principal and interest payments throughout. Uh, however, uh, under the state law, they do require level principal payments. It is a declining amount each year. The total uh, principal is 11 million 700,000 and the ballot, uh, if it goes to vote, will also indicate that the interest would be 7 million 722,000 over the 20 years. Go ahead. Oh, okay. The, uh, let's see. I think the, the question, there was a question re relating to uh, what was included in the budget. In the detail, there is a detailed list in our report, and, and uh, certainly when you uh, review that, uh, you can you'll ha have probably more questions. But uh, we have not really projected for replacing all of the furnishings in these buildings. We're trying to do this on uh, as tight a budget as possible. Uh, certainly, the school department will have to, to use the, the furnishings that they now have. However, because of, of the nature of the construction, there certainly will be a certain amount of furnishings that have to be included uh, in addition, uh, and that is projected in, in the budget. All of these things in, the, in detail form as to what we can reuse and what we need to supply will be in the next step. That is something we need to address. Uh, our task uh, and, and our goal when we all reviewed this was that we looked at the project uh, and started from scratch. Uh, we had no uh, conceptions as to, to what we would even do when we began to meet as a committee. Uh, we looked at each step uh, and took one step at a time uh, to evaluate the problems uh, and we quickly surmised that uh, it was not really feasible to do a band-aid approach, that we, couldn't, we could not just address uh, the mechanical systems, we could not just address the site issues. Uh, all of these things are so integrated uh, that uh, it became apparent that we needed to, to really analyze all of the buildings um, in both the middle and the Plum Cove School. Uh, and I think we have done that. Uh, unfortunately, our report uh, uh, has not been out all that long. We, uh, the beginning of the summer in July was finally approved by the, uh, we submitted it to be approved by the town council and it was approved. Uh, and for the next six or eight weeks, uh, you certainly will have a lot of homework to do to, to catch up where we have been taking these steps. Uh, but we will make the, the information available. Uh, we'll have uh, literature at the library. Uh, Connie? I just want to point out there are two piles on the table back there, they are two separate pieces. They are copies of the executive summary and the existing conditions. Please help yourself. We'll make more of those available, and we will leave copies of the full report at the library to be signed out or to be read there. And we have a couple of copies of the would be glad to do that kind of thing. But I think the material in the back there will be a good start. And we'll keep making them. And again, I, I, I believe I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that, that we are available for any of your questions and, and comments and, and concerns. Uh, if there's something that, that uh, whether we have a, a quick answer for you or not, if we don't, we certainly will find out the answer. Uh, we want the citizens to understand uh, the project and understand the, the problems uh, and be able to uh, vote intelligently, uh, whether for or against. Have I answered uh, or our team answers all of your questions? My notes are none of yours. Uh, asbestos. Um, essentially, the asbestos question first. That is part of the report. Uh, very complete. 
uh, analysis and so on, and uh, it is not unfortunately part of the materials in the back, but you're more than welcome to borrow mine if you'd like to look at it. Um, obviously, I've read that article in the New York Times, and I also watched 60 Minutes, and I've been following the saga of the New York City custodians with a good deal of angst. Um, we have had a lot of effort put into reorganizing custodial and maintenance operations. There's no question that we have a long way to go. And I would love to talk to you about the hours and hours we've spent with that. And as far as finding proper personnel who knows and so on, I really would like the opportunity to go in, into some detail. Just a uh, summary, there is no question that we will save on operational costs. We're going to be, the result of this project is going to leave us with about the same amount of square footage that we now have, only we designed and so on. Um, and if this is with an envelope or single pane, very leaky, very badly insulated buildings, and we have asked the architects to give us some kind of of uh, using whatever rule of thumb they get to show that. It's, but we will not need more people to run the operations because, again, it is, in fact, if anything, the people we have, the staff we have, and the routines that we're working out will only work far smoother than they do now. I didn't quite capture that 700,000 repair figure. We have not been spending that much. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Well, I do know we overexpended one, just to give you an example, uh, by about $60,000 in mechanical services fees because we had such a two reasons. One was some, um, some frankly, just plain deferred maintenance problems at the high school, which I'm glad we were able to catch up with because that's a 20-year-old building and it should be, uh, we shouldn't really be having those kinds of problems. I had uh, hired somebody who had the kind of expertise frankly the system had not had and we were able to catch that and deal with it in a cost effective way. Most of that money was mechanical services day in, day out because of the frozen fish, because of the little boy with his jacket, because of um, and just you know, a whole string of problems with an antiquated system that being patched together required emergency crisis. That's about a $60,000 figure. Now you have an estimate of what we are now spending on repairs, band aid repairs, just to try to deal with the air quality. Friends, we've pulled up carpet, we have scraped paint, we have a variety of things to try to get proper circulation of air. All of those things are adding to our operating budget, my guess is, including some very conservative figure on uh, oil conservation, anywhere from 150 to 200,000 years. I mean, we, I, you know, frankly, three years ago, I walked into the middle school and talked to Peter and said, you know, you don't have a space problem here. You have a massive renovation problem. Anybody that knows buildings, frankly, could tell you that. And we've been working with that kind of thing. And um, so part of the whole idea of reorganizing the maintenance and custodial situations is to make sure we have a clearly operative way of dealing with that when we get in the building. Um, the, uh, those kinds of, of, of issues training issues and so on are going right now. Okay? May I request that if you have any further questions out there that you direct them through the chair. We're not going to get in the habit here of person to person, please. And I'll, and I'll really start to worry about the time. <laughs> Paul, how are you doing? Uh, <clears throat> I'm doing fine. All right, I got one that I'd like to have Mike that I know somebody out here asked about what we have facing us for other debt. Let's have the town manager answer that one. Yes, the woman from Loxley Road, I didn't catch your name, asked what other debt will be facing us. Uh, there, there are a number of issues. One is uh, there's a pending bond for some ADA improvements to this building. Uh, we're looking at putting an elevator in so that the second floor is accessible. Uh, some other minor improvements in municipal buildings. Uh, second, the town has some pending litigation uh, over the Thomas Jordan land, which is the area that involves the refuse disposal area and the land uh, across uh, the road from it. Uh, there's been discussion about the town uh, potentially buying that land from the Thomas Jordan Trust. That is in litigation, and I can't say too much more about it. Uh, both of those will be uh, less than a million dollars, uh, but the exact amount isn't known. Uh, beyond that, there are a number of issues that are sort of floating out there, but s certainly have no support that, that I've heard of, uh, but uh, that, that are off there. I shouldn't say no support, but uh, one is to address some public safety, uh, particularly the police station, some space issues. Uh, second is the, uh, the high school pool is aging dramatically. Uh, the council hasn't even had reports uh, on the latter one. 
uh, but those are something that, that might be looked at uh, over the next few years. But nothing's been authorized. And this is just uh, looking out off into the future. I wish I hadn't asked you. <laughs> yes? Yeah, the county just built a new jail with a new sheriff's office attached to it. Uh, that debt uh, is all uh, is now being paid. Uh, the county budget committee has told the county commissioners in very clear terms that they don't want to see any more county tax increases. Uh, they don't really know what will happen from that, but uh, that debt's been uh, all paid for. That was an, an anomaly in the, with the county is to suddenly have that surge. Uh, uh, that just hasn't been seen in the past, and it was for a voter-approved jail. You know, this is probably one of the best public hearings that I have ever sat through. I think it's wonderful. I want to thank the committee, the school board, the superintendent of schools, and you, the public. It's been really great, and I think your questions are wonderful. Now, this doesn't stop tonight. This was your chance to see these people, ask questions, and get them answered. But these three tours that are coming up over at the high school, you can get all kinds of questions answered. And they're not going to leave the hall if you get them down the corner and don't let them go. And get them answered tonight if you have additional questions. So with your permission, Paul, I will now close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, might, might I ask them to explain any other informational efforts that they're going to be putting forth yes, in sure. the next few weeks before the Could you do that for potential us? vote? Any other promotional or educational ideas? Okay. Uh, we will be having two more. We have two more scheduled tours now. One is this Saturday um, from 10 to 12, um, and that people are supposed to be in the middle school parking lot for that. The next one is October 2nd. Um, at the Pond Cove Fair, which is taking place on the 26th of September, um, from 11 to 3, we will also have a booth with information and people will be able to go on tours, see the model and various other things, ask plenty of questions. Um, we'll be having information for parents at, at the open houses in the schools. Uh, we're right now trying to get in touch with service groups and various clubs around town to see if they'd like us to come speak to them. And we're going to be organizing a core of volunteers to get to leaflet neighborhoods hold neighborhood coffees, invite particular neighborhoods into the schools um, as, as they wish. Um, so I would encourage anybody who wants to get involved with this to contact me or Connie or anybody else on the committee who they know, um, and certainly to contact any building committee members um, or the superintendent. If, if you have direct questions, we'd all be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from the council before we get on to Okay, that's good. Uh, I know you're all going to sit around and wait for the next eight items that the council has to do tonight, but in case you do decide to go home, thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Let's take a five-minute adjournment, shall we? So we can stretch. We'll reconvene at 9.30. Will you please come to order, if we may? We we'll go to item number 53 to consider forwarding to the citizen referendum proposed improvements to the Cape Elizabeth Middle School and the Pond Cove Elementary School and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, would you please explain what we have to do on item number 53? Yes, if the council wishes this to go to referendum, the bond council for the town, the firm of P.S. Atwood et al., has prepared a draft motion. Uh, what you'd in essence be doing is authorizing $11.7 million. You'd be authorizing uh, the borrowing of the money, uh, all necessary actions there too. Uh, and this is all subject to being approved by the voters of the town in a referendum election. And finally, at the end, you, you indicate that uh, 
this shall be submitted to the voters of the town at, at a referendum election to be held in November 2, 1993. This would set in motion uh, the entire project. Uh, you know, you'd still have reviews, you'd still have the uh, planning board uh, permit to occur, and you still have the, uh, obviously, the citizens vote. But this uh, is in all the legalese necessary uh, to satisfy those, uh, if this goes ahead, uh, that might be wanting to uh, let the town borrow some money. Entertain a motion, and then we'll have a discussion. I will move the uh, uh, authorization as spelled out uh, in the draft given uh, to us and uh, by the uh, town manager. I'll second the motion. Been moved and seconded that we authorize this draft as given to us by the town manager. Discussion. Just one point. This yes. is available. Will be available in the office tomorrow if anyone wants to see all of the legal wording that, that's here. Councilor Jordan. <clears throat> I have a problem with the fir first. <clears throat> excuse me. The first vote. That the Cabellus Town Council hereby authorize the expenditures of up to eleven point seven hundred million dollars for improvements and additions to and equipping the town elementary and middle school for the costs and expenses related thereto. Now, I feel if I vote the way this is worded here, that people are going to feel that uh, hey, they've already voted to do this. I and disturbed on the wording. I thought we were just here tonight to authorize that we go forward with the project until the people had a chance to go to the polls and vote on it, and then you would authorize the borrowing and what have you. Now, will somebody explain that to me because I a little thick sometimes. Mr. McGovern. <laughs> yes, can I? I was going to say yes, Councilor Jordan, but <laughs> I don't want to be agreeing with your last comment. Uh, the, the next to last paragraph of this draft order reads that the foregoing votes authorizing the expenditure of funds for the elementary and middle school project and the borrowing of monies to finance the same shall not be effective and no notes, bonds, or other evidences of indebtedness shall be issued pursuant to such votes until and unless the same have been approved by the voters of the town in a referendum election. It, 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 it intends to make clear that you are voting to go forward. However, it is subject uh, to uh, the referendum of the citizens uh, of Cape Elizabeth. And this type of vote is necessary under the state statute in order to send it out uh, to the voters, is that you first need to approve it uh, in language uh, very similar to this. I understand that vote at the end of it, but I'm just saying people are going to go to the polls and vote for this, and they're going to pick out what's on the first and not what's on the back of it, on the second page. This is my problem. Yeah, the, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The actual referendum question is, spells out, and the vote will be, the, the question shall be, if, if this goes forward, shall the town expend up to 11 million 700,000 for improvements and additions to and equipment of the elementary and middle schools and incur indebtedness by the issuance of bonds for such a purpose in the amount of 11,700,000 pursuant to votes of the town council dated September 13, 1993. There'll then be an opportunity to vote yes or no. Just as in state bond issues, you are now required under state statute to list current indebtedness uh, still to be paid for existing bonds, to list this bond, to list estimated interest on new bonds, and total debt service if additional bonds are, are issued. All of that information will be then listed, which is effective as of November 1st. Then it goes on to explain that uh, what the total payment is, the life of the bonds, how much the interest is, and then another paragraph that reads that if there's been a calculation error in any of this, uh, it does not uh, nullify the validity of the vote. If I may, like I said earlier, I don't think that, uh, but that sounds better when you ask me at the polls, shall I authorize it? Here it says the Cable of the Town Council hereby authorizes the expenditure. And I think that's a little different. In my 
opinion. Evidently, nobody else agrees. You got anything further? Yeah, You're all done? Yes, Council. I, I just want to add that, that uh, I certainly agreed with uh, Councilor Jordan um, until I got some of the explanation. And uh, I can go along uh, with the explanation. Uh, I probably, if I were a lawyer, might want to reword some of this, but not being a lawyer, I quit. Any, yes, Councilor Cargershaw. Well, I, I uh, agree with my fellow seatmates over here that if I vote yes tonight, it is not in complete approval of the entire project because I still have questions over it. But to let the citizens um, decide whether or not we should spend the money, and then you'll go through the process, I'm sure, and, and analyze the true needs. Um, I don't know. Should I ask my questions about my concerns now? Go ahead. Okay, there was a report due on the asbestos <coughs> removal. Um, we haven't seen any late of the latest estimates. Is it still in that $600,000 that's in your original projected report? We I thought there was an updated one that was received by the school board this past week. Uh, excuse me, I thought we had a final report with you. Was that on your desk? What we have was here we haven't had a chance to look through it okay. but the same the same chart is in there that was there before saying six hundred thousand dollars is that still is that the current estimate the report that you have now the the one that was on the desk tonight is the amount the same Yes. Because it's a little difficult to find it at the last minute. That's why I'm trying to take a shortcut. It's the last page. Okay. And it says that the amount that the consultant And that's with all hidden problems and everything else. Because you know Scarborough had a nightmare when they cut into theirs. My other concern is what I've voiced before was the complete elimination of the bus garage. Um, not having a definite site of where you're going to place the buses, the type of security or the electrical outlets if you leave them outside that need to run the block heaters. And I did a little informal survey of eight different towns in the area. Uh, six of them have some sort of storage for their buses. Um, two of them have only limited space. Others have the bus drivers take them home with them. They um, all wish they could have a facility available to keep them. The ones that they run every day, they try to garage, and this includes the city of Portland and South Portland. So I, I really think that needs to be addressed within the amount of the bond and not at an additional cost. Take that under advisement, will you, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just had to verify whether all communities did or did not have a storage facility, so 